And for those of you who've um, um, come back and, and joined us again, welcome back. And for those of you who are new, a uh, really warm welcome to you. It's it's um, wonderful to have you, you join us today. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sue Olovich and I'm a research student at the University of Sydney. And I'm really pleased to be coordinating the sessions this year with the CREATE team. And I'd like to begin um, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I work and learn today. I'm on the land of the uh, Darawal people and pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. Um, and I really invite yourself to introduce yourself in the chat and you might like to acknowledge the land upon which you're joining us from today as well. Um, so it's a real pleasure to um, introduce um, Paul Gardner, Dr. Paul Gardner. Paul is an experienced secondary drama and English teacher, and he's been chief examiner for HSC drama and a senior marker for the script writing component of the New South Wales HSC drama examination. And he established and led successful drama departments in the schools in which he's taught before embarking on his doctoral study. And his PhD research focused on playwriting pedagogy and creativity in the context of an external high stakes examination, resulting in his book, Teaching Playwriting, Creativity and Practice, which is published by Methuen Drama UK in 2019. Um, he was the Director of Research for Drama Australia in 2015 and 16, and he's currently a committee member of Drama New South Wales. How does that sound, Paul? Does that accurately describe you, do you think? Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. Well, there are some things that happened since, but yes, indeed. Oh, beautiful. You, you might like to, to add to that as you share to, today. And look, Phil, we're, we're a tiny group, but feel free to pop um, any comments or wonderings or curiosities or thoughts that you might have in the chat. We'll have a chance after Paul's um, shared today to um, to ask questions and to explore any of the aspects that, um, you know, you'd like to, to learn more about and, and find out more about as we go along. So I might throw it over to you, Paul, and um, let you take it away. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, in the interests of time, I'm actually um, going to be presenting something that I've prepared, and so I'm going to 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 approach uh, approach it that way. Um, however, as you said, uh, Susan, if you if if the participants want to ask a question, feel free to interrupt, and I can uh, you know, especially considering there's such an such a small group. Um, <laughs> Uh, Michael, I apologise, you've already heard this before clearly as my supervisor, but um, okay, so what I might do is I might, um, again, I'd like to, to um, uh, acknowledge the, uh, the country that I'm on, the, the, of the Gunungurra people. Um, my um, engagement with country is always uh, one of personal interaction and I'm, I, I'm very grateful today um, for the land I have because it's rainy and I have a big backyard. Um, but even though it's raining, um, I have two lovely puppies who are, are running amok in the mud. And I'm uh, I'm not really being ironic, but I might be when I say I'm, I'm really enjoying the country that I'm on and the fact that they will be so muddy at the end of the day, that they will get a bath uh, like the kings that they are. So each day they come in for a sponge bath because of the mud. That's my acknowledgement of the beauty of, of a gratefulness of country or gratitude to country. I'm going to um, uh, share my screen uh, and we will go ahead. Uh, that one, that one. Um, are we seeing the right one? Everybody. Very good. Okay. So um, to begin, um, I run lots of professional learning workshops for teachers uh, wanting to develop their skills and understanding of how to teach playwriting um, in secondary classrooms. What I find in these, in these workshops is that while teachers understand theatre and performance conventions and feel confident working with students in devising and script interpretation work, they feel underprepared in scaffolding strategies for students to write their own plays. While it is based um, somewhat in lack of understanding of how writing happens, what they respond most positively to in the workshops um, are the strategies I offer on how to address the creative process. 
um, and that I grant them permission to engage with what they initially saw as a personal, perhaps even mysterious process. They feel underprepared to approach creativity with their students and had little confidence in developing strategies that generate and enrich a student's creative capacity and creative confidence. The products of my research and continuing research seek to address that lack. Now, to the beginning of my story. After nearly 20 years of classroom practice and 10 years as senior marker for the HSC individual project, script writing in New South Wales, I was interested in how teachers and students work together to write, together to write a play and wondered about the impact the teacher's pedagogy had on the student's experience of completing a creative task for external assessment. In my classroom practice, I had worked with hundreds of students in both, um, in both group and individual tasks and wondered how the teacher impacted the student's capacity to create. In the very early defining stages, Um, I was inspired by the work of Helen Nicholson, in particular, her argument that as students take control of a dramatic form, they are granted an expanded cultural field and given opportunities for thought previously inconceivable. Having parallels with a semiotic approach to theatre making, I was also inspired uh, by Michael Anderson and Miranda Jefferson's Tools of Creation and Michael's associated concepts of aesthetic control and aesthetic understanding. Um, as Michael argues, our job as drama educators is to create a structured understanding of aesthetics and to allow students to use that aesthetic to create their own work. My research used the central concepts to investigate teachers' practice in the drama classroom. And good. So, my study. My PhD research explored the teaching and learning of playwriting in secondary schools. It focused on the experiences of students who were writing a short play for external assessment. In this case, the New South Wales Higher School Certificate Drama Examination and the pedagogical approaches adopted by teachers. My research question was, what are the teaching and learning experiences of students and teachers preparing a script for external assessment for the New South Wales HSC. I adopted a case study approach gathering data from student teacher pairs in eight sites. So my uh, explanation here is the is both my PhD and postdoctoral research. Um, I looked at five sites in my po postdoctoral uh, in my PhD and, and, and a further three in my postdoctoral work. I adopted a case study approach gathering data from student teacher pairs in eight sites, nine teachers and eight year 12 final year students. The participants were from independent and government schools and the teachers were generally mid-career with experiences both teachers and markers of HSC. The students, while choosing to write a script for their individual project, had limited prior experience of playwriting with many never having written a play before this project. The qualitative data collected consisted of semi-structured interviews, play drafts, student logbooks, observations of teaching and learning sessions and workshop readings of the student's scripts. I also observed playwriting, teaching and learning sessions and play reading workshops. What I'd like to talk about now is the, the, the reasoning or the, the insights about qualitative data that have informed my approach. And so um, the, the the exploratory, the exploratory study was designed to illuminate the situation occurring in schools by generating data to improve practice and to lead to principal bases for knowing. Um, my objective was to learn from the participants. What was, what was key to my um, approach to my qualitative research was the recognition that, uh, that all research is interpretive. So as Eisner says, uh, Eisner explores the fundamentally interpretive nature of all inquiry, that even quantitative numbers begin first with this decisions about qualities. He argues to count the number of times a teacher raises a higher order question depends not only on numbers, but what counts as a higher order question and deciding that requires interpretation. So it is a way of approaching qualitative 
research with the same kind of confidence and um, belief in its ability to provide insights uh, as quantitative data. Um, Freebody extended this idea, uh, suggesting that despite qualitative research often being compared unfavorably to hard quantitative research, all research is subjective. He argues that quantitative research begins with qualitative decisions and philosophical considerations, and that these assumptions they're taken for grantedness are often neither explicated nor admitted. So the idea that we often uh, hear the, the quantitative researchers um, argue for the, the, the strength of their research uh, without actually explicating the philosophical assumption that started it and therefore the interpretive nature of the beginning um, was something that really motivated me and, and uh, encouraged me on my qualitative journey. Research is interpretive, and my objective was to seek depth and detail, to emphasize discovery, description, and meaning rather than prediction, control, and measurement. My methodol methodology sought to understand how people experience a phenomena from the person's own perspectives. So the emphasis upon uh, the, the experience of the participants was, was paramount to, to my approach. And two key ideas uh, that, that um, I continually hold on to uh, are, are these. The first is that as Fedemitic argues, their most, significant their most significant reality or set of realities is found in the subjective realities of human perception. What people believe to be true is more important than any objective reality. People act on what they believe. And so my, my uh, intention in, is always uh, to go and ask and, and gather and, as I'm about to talk about, generate data um, from their perspectives uh, about how they, um, they interpret the reality in which they live more than trying to perceive or, or create any sort of objectivity. Qualitative research occurs in a consciously and overtly unrealistic context. And one of the most unrealistic features is the presence of the researcher. So while I'm trying to understand and I'm, I'm generating data about uh, their perceptions and their how they believe and their conceptions of what happens, I have to recognize that my presence changes that significantly. Um, qualitative research, I always talk about data and knowledge for that matter as being generated. It is not found, it doesn't emerge, it is co-created by the researcher and participants in a natural, unnatural event. The natural event is that we're talking, generally speaking, in their um, in their environment, in their classrooms, in their schools. Um, the unnatural event is we're asking them to reflect upon their practice and to talk about their practice. Um, the research adopted a social constructivist paradigm, recognizing that meaning is formed, created, and understood in interaction with others, which leads to one of the key limitations and the key observations that I found in, in my research. Open interviews in particular, but interviews in general, are reconstructive moments where teachers described their ideal creative pedagogies, as well as the real reality of pedagogies in their classroom. It led to participants offering more discussion of creativity in their classroom than what they actually experienced. I mean, this may have been a byproduct of the instrument, but the teachers, when discussing their process, conflated their intellectual and experiential understanding of what they should do with the reality of what they did in practice. What was really important for my research then was that I had uh, data that was generated from other than self-report mechanisms. So what I was able to do, as I mentioned in a previous slide that I collected, I'm going back to it for you, um, document study. And in my particular context, there was a document that the students create, which is a record of the, the teaching and learning activities, the record of their process. Now, for fortuitously or by design of my research, that record is independent of my research. The students do it for the HSC. I didn't ask them to do it. It was something that they um, had to do. And what was really important was that having that, um, that, that document that um, was able to, to um, 
confirm or deny to use that phrase uh, whether the, what the teachers and the students were saying was very important. Similarly, the observations uh, and the observations of the teaching and learning um, moments was were particularly important too because that allowed me to listen to this discussion, to listen to um, to what they were actually uh, engaged, what the teaching and learning activities they were engaging in, to decide um, how not to decide, but to add to the data about their self-report uh, about what their practices were. Um, but as I said, consciously, um, um, a naturally unnatural situation, I knew that even in the teaching and learning that I was watching, they knew I was there. So they were on their, the, their best behavior, so to speak. All right, so what did I find? Um, so what I found was that there was a very strong relationship between knowledge, creativity, agency and engagement. What surprised me the most and is reinforced by in my continuing work with teachers was that the students and teachers view of creativity was at the core of the pedagogical dynamic, pedagogical dynamic. Initially, my focus was to investigate the influence of dramaturgical theory on teaching and learning uh, activities and subsequently on the kind and quality of student plays. However, it emerged in the study that the teachers and students did not explicitly engage with semiotic or genre theory. And generally speaking, especially in the initial stages, there was very little structured teaching at all. While the teachers and students acknowledged this lack of the uh, theoretical or pedagogical input, it was often explained as a virtue, not an omission. They indicated that they did not follow a program, but carried out each student teacher session based on point of need discussion with the individual student. The teachers reported that they did not consult playwriting texts in preparing for their interactions, believing their role was to respond as an experienced theatre goer once there was something to critique. In practice, that meant go away and write something and I will tell you if it is any good. Their view of creativity and what can be done to assist a creative process to find the teaching and learning practices and in turn, the student's experience. The desire not to intervene in the creative process was based on their belief that a structured course was unnecessary and unhelpful. The teacher's distrust of teaching and learning intervention was connected to their view that the student's unique talent, the student's creativity and individual voice needed to be protected from the limiting effect of rules and knowledge. Some of the participants even indicated a belief in innate creative talent that did not need domain knowledge or knowledge of theatre um, techniques and conventions. I found that creativity in the classroom was heavily influenced by often unexamined myths that creativity can't be taught and therefore um, playwriting can't be taught. It reflected the romantic belief that creativity is innate, that you either have it or you don't, and that it is really a special gift reserved for the gifted few. For the teachers, this meant that the best you can do is to go, um, to, is to get out of the way and make sure there are no typos. I mean, that exaggerated the position slightly, but there was a belief that knowing might taint the young person's naive talent. I call this the belief in the myth of intrinsic creativity and it impacted most of my research science. This approach to creativity was surprising, but not without warning. There exists a large and long-standing debate about the value of teaching, um, about a value of teaching playwriting. There, there exists among some playwrights, a clear suspicion of the teaching of, of craft, fearing that pedagogy corrupts rather than edifies. Harrington and Bryan in their collection of interviews with American playwrights sum up the view that when they ask, is there a danger that the very act of instruction can in fact stifle the creative promise? But as David Edgar argues, there is an inconsistency in the views on training in the theater arts that actors and designers are encouraged to acquire their skills formally, but writers and directors are supposed to acquire their skills telepathically. Steve Waters concurs, suggesting that writing a play has always required knowledge of past practices. Eslin and Cassano further argue that innovative works reimagine existing conventions rather than create new techniques. 
So what did this belief in intrinsic creativity mean for teachers and students embarking on what is a very specific and challenging creative task? Can students write a play in a virtual vacuum? As I suggested, um, when teachers believed that cre creativity was innate, uh, they chose to not intervene in the creative process, defining themselves as facilitators who shape and refine drafts that is predominantly editing and proofreading. Some suggested that the creative part of the process, in their view, the initial moment of idea generation was not actually part of their brief. This led to the practice I called problematization, where aspects of the play that didn't, didn't work were unclear or were not effective were identified for improvement in the next draft, the red pen effect. When not in a sequence program, the feedback was reactive and did not include strategies to empower them to solve those problems. Problematization worked to focus students on what they cannot do or couldn't or, or have not done. And without scaffolding skill and knowledge development, students did not improve in their ability to meet the increasingly complex iterative process of playwriting. As McWilliam suggests, we need to rethink the position of, of the teacher and to unlearn what it means to teach creativity. The passive, uh, passive observer who lets creativity emerge and then who corrects the mistake stifles creativity. I suggest we see the teacher's role as that of a dramaturg, one who can build student proficiency, identify possibilities and not merely highlight flaws. The teacher should be one who understands how meaning is made uh, and how to scaffold students' creativity skills and playwriting knowledge. The distinction here is fundamental, fundamental and is explained best by thinking about where the teacher is positioned. Where does the teacher sit in the theatre when they engage with the play? in the audience as a critic or backstage with the writer. The play should then not be problematized, but analyzed. Sam Smiley suggests analysis means separating the whole into parts and studying those parts and their relationships. Whereas criticism frequently amounts to adverse commentary regarding faults and shortcomings. If the student perceives the teacher as critic, the students then see the teacher as the one who should tell them what is wrong with their play and how to fix it. Specific solutions rather than specific skills to allow students to develop proficiency to solve the problems themselves. Ironically then, a belief in intrinsic creativity reinforced the primacy of the teacher, especially in high stakes assessment where students would pressure teachers to solve the problems that the teachers themselves had identified. We then need to rethink how we approach creativity in our classrooms. As Kraft suggests, the objective of creativity is empowerment. A dramaturgical model empowers students while also diminishing the role of teacher as problematizer and solution finder. It encourages teachers to understand how to empower students so that they know what to do when they don't know what to do, as McWilliam so um, clearly states. The model also encourages teacher empowerment through fostering their own increased knowledge and pedagogical skills which would go some way to addressing the teacher's feeling of feelings of inadequacy and dissatisfaction that I found in my study. A teacher's ability and willingness to teach for creativity across the arts is strongly influenced by their domain knowledge. Adina and Welsh's study of music teachers found that those with greater content knowledge, especially formal training, were more flexible and more able to recognize creative products offered by the students and then provide advice that would aid its development. Those with less training were more inclined to offer predetermined activities and expect creativity to grow. Challenging the efficacy of invisible pedagogy, Chapel's study of uh, expert dance teachers found that teaching for, for creativity involved teachers navigating across spectra of pedagogical approaches to balance developing a student's individual voice and their craft compositional knowledge. As Lucas argues, creativity is too important to be left to the happenstance of the spectacularly creative teacher. Lassig argues teachers, um, teaching students about creativity is similarly important. 
students' creative capacity and creativity is enhanced by encouraging them to think explicitly about their own process and encourage them to experiment with applying different approaches to different tasks and self-assess self the outcomes of their creative experiences. So it's not only theatre dramaturgy that a teacher needs, but creativity dramaturgy as well. In response, I, I have developed a creativity workshop approach to playwriting pedagogy that puts creative processes and drama knowledge together, together from the beginning of the playwriting process with idea, sorry, idea generation um, strategies and collaboration as fundamental to developing students' creative capacity and creative confidence. So why is this important? Another important finding um, for my research was that play, playwriting was an important learning experience for student agency. Writing a play uh, offered students an opportunity to explore, develop and generate their views of the world. And further, this experience was associated with a sense of personal growth, an experience unique in the student's school career. In each site, the students considered playwriting, playwriting as an opportunity to express their views on big issues. Their play provided a metaphorical and thus relatively safe discussion of their lives as young people. The process helped the students understand the story they were living and to share their realizations with a real and imagined audience. Writing and play empowered the students by validating their experiences and their interpretation of those experiences. Playwriting offered students the opportunity to see their ideas and life experience as valid content for a play, elevating them from the ordinary to the universal. As Sandra Gatnoff argues, to have their voices heard in response to issues that impact upon them creates a sense of belonging for young people whose voice is often marginalised in society. Further, they took the opportunity to question and to try to make sense of the world. The desire to change society was evident in all the plays, demonstrating the capacity of theatre to empower. As Bowal suggests, to build a future instead of just waiting for it. As Doyle argues, a play written by students does not um, just reflect community values when read or performed by others, but becomes part of that community and is a critical interaction with that culture. It is reformulating a culture as much as it is objectifying it. However, what also emerged was a relationship between the students' playwriting proficiency and their feelings of agency. Agency is more than freedom to choose ideas. The students need the proficiency to articulate them. As Nicholson argues, students need proficiency in theatrical literacy and dramatic vocabulary to imagine new opinions and ideas to broaden their cultural frame. The potential inherent in playwriting to encourage agency needs to be supported by scaffolding learning experiences to ensure opportunity is supported by skill development. To rewrite the world, one needs the literacy to write and the vocabulary to rethink. My research suggested that playwriting knowledge and skill is not a restraint, but that it is enabling and to remove or withhold it is an act with strong implications for agency. Developing greater playwriting proficiency in schools will work to broaden the skill base for our young writers and encourage diversity and democracy of voices in content and in form. Playwriting has the potential to offer authentic opportunities for students to grapple with big issues and develop a lasting proficiency that fosters symbolic and creative thinking. It encourages students to develop their reflective skills and increases self-knowledge, while also encouraging a belief in their ability to contribute to and influence their culture and their world. At a time when the need for a greater understanding of ourselves and each other is so pressing, increased engagement with playwriting and its ability to encourage both empathy and personal growth seems a practice that deserves much attention. The playwriting workshop approach has in also encourages actual collaboration and community engagement in a time when contact with others is becoming increasingly virtual and mediated. The benefits of playwriting to our students has the long-term potential to contribute to more diverse and vibrant new performance writing, as well as the potential to encourage more engaged and culturally aware citizens, contributing to a more diverse, empathetic and vigorously democratic society. The major conclusion for my research is that creativity is the currency of the 21st century. 
Therefore, teaching for and about creativity is the best way to prepare our students for the volatile, ambiguous and complex future. And luckily, creativity as a process and an ability is something that is freely available to all, independent of school resources or location. What it does need though, are teachers who can model, support, reward and expect creativity. References. Five minutes over time, sorry. Oh, Paul, that was just such an interesting presentation. Um, thank you so much. Can you join with me in thanking Paul? Thank you so much. I've got lots of questions and, and wonderings, but I'd like to put an offering out to, to Matt and, and Mary and, and, of course, to Michael. Um, if there's anything that you would like to, to unmute, feel free. I could see, Matt, you nodding away and, and, and smiling at certain times during the, uh, the presentation. Some things were really resonating. Um, while you're having time to, to perhaps... Um, um, generate um, so a response or, or ask any questions. I, I would love to jump in with a, a curiosity that I had, um, Paul, when you were talking about um, the, the way the way that you gathered um, your data around the, the teachers' understandings of creativity, which was was fascinating to to hear their their, their perception that um, that creativity is something that can't be taught. I'm wondering whether um, you were also gathering um, the, the thoughts of, of students around whether they shared that perception that their teachers couldn't, in fact, or shouldn't, in fact, teach creativity. It was something that was actually supposed to be innate. Did they share that view or did they, they have a different view? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, as would be expected with the number of participants, it was kind of, um, uh, it, you know, it was varied. So there were a lot of students who had quite uh, significant um, experience of, of creative practice in other areas and... Um, they kind of, uh, from memory, were, you know, were a bit surprised that creativity wasn't part of the process. But mm. generally speaking, um, if I was to come down on one way, I, there was a sense that they shared that. And I think, as I was saying, um, the the teachers' view of creativity in, impacted the teaching and learning experiences. So mm. I think they kind of were taught by the teacher that creativity mm. was something that they had to do themselves, mm. that it was up to them, that there were no real processes or, or scaffolding even that mm. would help them. Mm. Um, mm. And in many ways, they were implicitly and explicitly told that they had to do all that kind of early creative work themselves and come with a kind of an idea that then the teacher would be able to structure and Mm. Um, you know, mm. modify and, you know, ask questions about. But, yeah, there was a, a, a real um, sense that the, the teachers had kind of influenced the, the students' views clearly too. Mm. Mm. That's fascinating. And are you finding in your, your current research, like beyond um, that study, that, that there's been a shift um, or you're noticing? Uh, <laughs> okay. No. No, and, and and my most recent research um, is actually dealing with, um, which is interesting, Susan, uh, primary teachers. I'm working pro yeah. predominantly with primary teachers now. Right. Uh, and um, the work that I'm doing uh, in the, the, the transformation that happens at the end of the course mm. really reflects that they had never really thought that they had permission to deal with it. They hadn't really understood creativity as a practice. The, there's a very strong um, kind of the the idea that that that, that you either are creative or you're not yes. perseveres. The yes. idea that some people are creative and others aren't perseveres. But I also think that's because of their school experience that they were taught that, and yes. they were taught, and you know, in terms of our own understanding of, of the arts pedagogy, they were taught poorly. And and what's really happened is that. What I found is that the lessons I've learned in this very specific uh, area of playwriting is, actually, you know, if this is the microcosm, then the the macrocosm of arts education in primary school reflects that even more strongly. Mm -hmm. That students who were were um, who were good at something in the in the arts before they came to class, that that kind of advantage kind of stayed for their entire creative or uh, their entire primary life because. There was no real um, structured learning of the arts in primary school. There certainly wasn't any 
sense that um, the, the teachers believed that, 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 you know, as generalist teachers, that they had to work on skill development. It was more like, let's just express what you already know. Let's just give, you know, and, and um, while there were some of my student, current students, um, their experiences were of great arts education and um, there were a, a great number who had significant music um, education from music specialists who would come in and teach everybody on a different day. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, whatever, um, you know, they came out with a view that they weren't creative because they didn't get, uh, they uh, they couldn't draw um, when they went in and they certainly couldn't draw at the end because they didn't, um, you know, have enough structured, scaffolded um, you know, teaching and learning experiences. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Um, we've got. That's a... really funny because it's only now that I've re um, revisited the specifics of of that research that I've made that connection of yeah. the microcosm and the macrocosm because it's exactly the same. That none of these lessons, I mean, some of the specifics are different, but very generally speaking, it's exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, and I worry because you know we, we I, I talk about in, in my work I talk about um, I, I give examples of really bad arts education. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, the students put their hand up and say that happened yesterday in the in you know when I was at in in schools doing some professional experience like yes. they go in a day at a time in the first like a day a week yes, yes. Go, that's exactly what happened yeah the student hand the teacher handed out a, a a worksheet the teacher told them when to when to stop coloring when to move to the next color all the, exactly the same bam it was really quite frightening yeah yeah that's fascinating. Uh, we've had a, um, Murray had to, to duck off, but she has said thank you. Um, but she also popped a link in the chat around, um, uh, she's made the comment around um, teaching practices might be worth exploring. She's got an ABC Radio National uh, link there um, that, that might be worth uh, worth okay. looking Lovely. at as well. So thanks for that, um, Murray. And uh, Matt, is there anything you wanted to add to the, uh, the chat at all? Um, look, Thanks, Paul. That was um, that was great. I wrote down so many notes and had all sorts of questions, which a lot of them that you then answered. Um, I should just say, look, I mean, the reason why I'm here is for a couple of reasons. One is I currently work with the National Centre for Cultural Competence at the University of Sydney, and um, my background is in theatre and performance studies, as is my um, uh, doctorate. And I'm then looking to how to 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 bring theatrics or, or drama into cultural competence, um, particularly cultural competence uh, training um, and particularly teaching and learning. Um, but then also, yeah, I'm really fascinated by um, that that idea of a creative process. So look, I don't know where to start with questions, but one of them that came up was this issue of agency and and the role of agency within a, a school curriculum and forgive my naivety i i don't know anything about the the school curriculum um i mean it's pleased i'm pleased to see that uh, that that playwriting uh, as well as drama has been strengthened um since i went to school when it was done as part of um you know an english class um would someone stand up and, and read a bit of macbeth or something it was just ghastly um, but in terms of um, the role of agency in the curriculum, is it is it made explicit, or is that like a a, 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 a byproduct that 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 is that that may or may not come about through the the the, the process? Um, now, in terms of the explicitness, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, like in terms of the syllabus and things like that, we don't necessarily talk about it. But uh, right, uh -huh. but it's a depth, but it's a uh, it's a clear um, objective and um, kind of well uh, well understood benefit that all drama teachers um, engage in the work. We, we know that the the benefits to agency that come from from doing drama is is a, is huge, and it's something we acknowledge and we celebrate and we talk about quite frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's. Um, the the drama curriculum and the drama syllabus in New South Wales is particularly strong in that it balances the the um, the incidental benefits and the instrumental benefits beautifully. I think mm -hmm. in that we recognise that we're not making actors, we're not making directors. However, the rigour of the of the content is is such that it still allows 
um, the development of proficiencies rather than just um, you know fun experiences, mm-hmm. uh, as you say of of you know uh, putting on a play and and not you know we we have rigorous content that students um, develop and it's what you know Michael's concept of aesthetic um, control and aesthetic understanding like we develop this understanding first and then they manipulate it they play mm-hmm. it uh, and that that you know. Um, means that agency is is kind of validated rather than this empty experience of oh that was fun and i you know there, there's a reason that they that they do feel um competent because they've developed this competence yeah. and they're quite skilled but as i said it's this it's this kind of not double think this is idea that we know they're not producing actors um mm. it's not an active school not mm. an active class mm. but we know that making them very very good at acting is is a necessary part of that process as I said, it's it's a very fine balance that I think you do extraordinarily well. Mm. Thanks. Thank you. Fascinating. Anything else you wanted to ask about, Matt? Um, oh, look, I, I, I don't know. I, there's the, the, the role of the teacher is so interesting. So can I ask that in your PhD study, the all of the teachers were uh, drama high school teachers? Absolutely. And not only were they drama high school teachers, all but one were mid-career, extraordinarily uh, experienced. So it wasn't a, a you know, like mm-hmm. a, a, um, a novice mistake. It was, uh, a mistake's too strong a word, but, a, a, you know, um, a, a approach coming from, you know, lack of experience. It was, it was well-developed, well-seasoned. Mm. Right. Yeah. No. I just think that I don't know. There seems to be some like tension in the role or the roles of the teacher as being the teacher on one hand, and then also are they there as a co-creator of 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 that that play script? Um, yeah. And then what does that do in terms of the the I don't know the power dynamic between the teacher and students, and then students viewing that teacher as suddenly becoming like a yeah a co-creator or a what have you rather than the teacher so yeah it's that, that's really actually interesting a, a, an insightful comment Matt because the the problem with the high stakes examination is that the teachers are very conscious that they can't co-create yeah they, you know but that's why the dramaturg idea comes into it because as we as we know when the dramaturg works with, with the director the director's ideas um and this is the, the this is the, the image I give you know they have this 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 avant-garde this innovative director who's all the, and it's all their ideas and then the dramaturg says yeah no that's been done no that's been done uh, no try and this is the, and, the, and then so all the ideas still belong to the director and the, and the, the dramaturg doesn't co-create or doesn't doesn't is doesn't take ownership or co-ownership of the ideas um but they provide all that con- that consolidated um kind of understanding and mm. and can feed back on what's happening um and but as i said about the rigor uh our drama teachers are very, very good at walking that line. We we're we're explicitly told to go back to the syllabus that we're not to direct, that we're not to, um, but we are to advise. And it's that balance between kind of giving the information and, and giving the uh, students access to that information and understanding in a way that's open rather than prescriptive. Mm. And I think that open questioning and open process. Um, the more research I'm doing, and because I'm doing some more research with drama teachers, they really have that understanding uh, about how to ask those um, uh, open questions that don't lead to to an answer, mm-hmm. but lead to a process that will that students will get to the answer mm-hmm. uh, in a way um, is quite strong, which is quite you know interesting compared to what I've found with playwriting. So maybe it is specific to a writing task because of that ownership. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Look, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise today um, with our our group. Um, It's really appreciated and um, we look forward to having an opportunity to have you share perhaps in the future because your work is really um, incredibly interesting and... Mm. Oh, well, I'm more than happy to to return. I'm I really value what the Create Centre is doing, and um, I'm more than happy to to be part of it. Wonderful. So thank you so much. Um, next time we get together um, in our 
HDR um, research group, we've got a presentation from Dr. Christine Hatton, and Christine's going to be presenting on drama research methods. So that will be on the mm. Thursday, the 18th of August. So everyone's really welcome to um, come along to that one as well. Um, so Matt, lovely to have you joining us today for the first time. Yeah, yeah thanks. I'll certainly come again. That was really day. that was really good. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah. Paul, big thank you for your contribution today. Yeah, it's thank really you, Paul. Much yeah. appreciated. No yeah. problems. Thank you. All right. Farewell, everyone. Yeah. Have thanks, everyone. Yeah. Stay thank well. you very much.